section half forward of the point of rotation. This must be eliminated. I'm not going to remove the toe. I simply will draw my therapeutic device. I'm going to trim the foot right on the radiograph. This is a club foot. Notice the heel, notice the toe, the dish. All these characteristics tell you it's a club foot radiographically without even looking at the foot itself. Once again, I'll mark the, the imprint of P3. This is where breakover must be. I'm going to mark the back of my heel at the widest part of the frog, and I'll put the breakover approximately where I would like it. Listen to the sound that we have of this foot. This horse came from the southwest, which is very dry. The foot is very hard. I do not like to trim the foot out on a very hard sole because it can be very painful. I use a propane torch and will soften the sole using the torch. This does not heat the internal structures of the foot. As you trim this off, you can actually feel the, the solar tissue is quite cool. All the heat is actually in the sole. Going back to our reference points now, we'll, we'll look at the derotation process. Derotation is something that's very difficult to teach. If you notice, all I'm going to do is back the heels up on this particular foot, starting at the point of the frog and working back. You do not trim these feet from the toe. Most all conventional shoeing and, and teaching techniques has actually led us to believe that all feet must be trimmed and shod from the toe back. With laminitis and the derotation process, the contrary is true. I rock of the toe at the point that I drew the line on the foot. I back the heels up to the widest part of the frog. This is the basic technique for all my derotation processes. The club foot, as you can see, we have quite a different shaped foot. You must always take in consideration that the club foot has a certain degree of digital rotation, not within the capsule, but within the digital alignment. Notice the shoe that I have removed is going to be set back on the foot in approximate disposition. Don't hesitate to use the propane to soften these really hard feet up. It makes it much, much easier to trim these out and it makes it much easier on the patient. Always trim the base of the frog first. Note how I've laid the rasp in the trim frog. That's the position of the bottom of P3. That's how you go from the radiographs to the foot. Those are your valuable landmarks. Back the heel up, go to the toe, do not invade the sole that lies over the tip of P3. It's very important to keep in mind our, our goals. We want to utilize the half of the hoof, which is the posterior half, that is basically not involved with the disease process. This will allow the front half to be rested and give us a window of therapy, a more favorable environment for healing and that's the basic goal for this whole technique. The four-point aluminum rail shoe, we usually start off with three-eighths by one or half by one aluminum bar stock. Use your apron or a wooden handle to test your temperature. Once you have got uh, the proper temperature, then it's quite easy to forge. You can actually forge aluminum uh, cold without having to uh, heat it at all, but it makes it a bit more difficult. I normally will pull the branches of my uh, heel first using the horn, that way you can pull it quite easily. And if you've got your shoe half made, by the time you get both branches pulled out. I, there's, there's numerous modifications, many ways to make the shoe. Uh, I, uh, I wish I were as proficient at shoe making as some of my colleagues, but this is a basic way that uh, I make the shoe to work for me. Design each shoe, very specifically, all little things about the shoe are designed to make the mechanical process work in my favor. Earplugs, I try to use earplugs most all the time. This will save your ears. You cannot believe how much uh, better you hear at night once you use your plugs all day. Then you pull the toe out. The closer to the edge of the anvil you, you do your pulling, of course, the easier it is on the face of your anvil. I will pull this forward. You can see why I, it's a great advantage to use a half inch by one with a large foot because I can actually pull the breakover out two to two and a half inches. As you pull the toe out, of course, it closes the heel. Instead of opening the shoe up, just flip it over and concave. Now, I will always go to the foot and, the, and test the width of the shoe before I concave because if it happens to be the proper width, then you need to grind this out and open the heels. You notice how just concaving the inside is open the heels. This typical shape is about what I need. Now, I go to the horn 
and rock her the toe. I'll rock her back to where I've actually started pulling the toe forward. It's not always necessary to do this, particularly if you're going to do the, uh, perform a tenotomy. Lay the shoe on. Notice we're break over. It's right where I drew the original line. I like to use a rasp instead of a grinder to dress my shoe up. I drill all my holes. I normally start with one eighth inch for most of my shoes. Most of the larger shoes, I go to a nine sixty fourth. Once again, the branches are ground out medial lateral, and break over is directly beneath the apex of P three. I will use the same bar stock. I normally will go uh, to half by one, and I cut my rails out. If you notice, I'm making, uh, I'll have at least three rails drawn so I can cut them on a bandsaw. This really facilitates uh, making the rails. You can forge them out just as easily. You should cut them about three eighths inch on the, uh, the top side or the thick side. Uh, cams on your anvil will help you to uh, shape these for the branch of the shoe. Those cams will also uh, show you how you can pinch your finger real good, so you got to be a bit careful. I want to open the heels up as wide as possible so I have as much support behind as I can get. If you follow the branch of the shoe exactly, you'll have a quite narrow base at the heel. Then I will warm the shoe back up again. I'm using a 110 uh, MIG which uh, runs with argon for aluminum welding. It's quite handy, but I found if I heat the shoe, it makes this particular uh, small welder to be much more efficient. Trying to weld on cold shoes is very difficult to get a nice smooth run. Again, you just tack the, uh, the rails to the shoe, take a rasp, clean them up. Try to avoid the use of the grinder as much as possible because aluminum dust is uh, not very good for you. If you do use do much grinding, it's best to always. If you notice the dust coming off of this, it's not good to be breathing that. It's always nice to have a little help around to quince all my shoes. This little fellow is learning the ropes. He uh, lucky to this day he hadn't been burnt yet. He has a lot of respect for the metal, and without him, I just couldn't hardly make it. Now, if you notice the particular characteristic of this shoe. I have a little elevation to reduce tendon pull. I have breakover at the point of rotation. I have a lot of concavity to the shoe, so I have absolutely no contact from the point of frog forward. The nails are set well into the branch of the shoe, so I don't have to worry about having a fine fit at the heels. All the nails will be behind the widest part of the foot. Now you cut your screen out for the advanced cushion. This particular material has been very durable. It has a fiber in it that allows uh, uh, it to be quite durable. Touch the heels once again so that the sulcus are, are very clean because I want the advanced cushion to fit well up into the sulcus alongside the frog. This is how we get so much mechanical support out of it. To measure the amount of advanced cushion you need, just take either red or the white, lay about half what you need in. Only a little experience you'll learn to uh, get the proper amount. You don't want to waste this stuff, but also you want to have uh, all you need. I'd rather have a little excess than not have enough. If you notice, I'm using the twist and pull technique again. It's very warm weather. You want to keep the, this particular product out of the palms of your hand because the heat from your hand will start the process of curing. So I like to use a very cool product. If you notice, I, I do not want any white areas left in at all. You must work those in, otherwise you'll have a division in the product. At summertime, I'll keep this on ice or keep it in the refrigerator, and then I'll use a heat gun to set it up once I put it in. If you're using this in hot climates, you've got to be very careful because it sets quite quickly in the summer. Take about half of it, spread it out over the foot, being careful to put it only where you want it. You lay the mesh over top, place your shoe on, set it very firmly. You need to note where you want the shoe set before you put the, the cushion in because you lose your point of reference. So. Pay attention to your, how the shoe comes back on the heel. You take any excess that may be on the side. Keep pushing and pulling. Don't be in any hurry to nail the shoe because I like to have the, the cushion to be setting a little bit before I start to nail. That way you're not rushed and you can have it setting precisely where you want it. And I use a heat gun to speed up the curing process. This allows me to, to anchor the shoe, the cushion, and I'm ready for nailing. 
I use a fish hook technique for practically all my laminated cases. This allows me to to use a very deep seated crease with all my shoes. I start by sole nailing. I push the nail slightly through the sole, first two or three little licks. Then with a quick lick, I'll bring the nail out. You'll notice the angle this nail comes out. Notice how it comes out at an angle. It's actually creating an arch within inside the hoof capsule, which you do not get with conventional nail pattern. You notice the angle if that nail emerges. It's the arch of the nail that's actually holding the shoe to the foot and not the clinch itself. Note the angle that I'm actually starting this nail. See how it emerges? There's a lot of tissue between the outer substance of the foot and that nail. And you just take your knife and trim off the excess. You do not want the advanced cushion to be protruded far below the, the rails because you want the rails to make contact about the same time it does with the cushion. Trim outs, particularly over the sole area. I usually put a little notch in the back. That's an extra $50 notch for those of you that aren't familiar with it. Finish the foot off in traditional fashion. I do not block these horses down. Remember, these horses are lame. You, they're not going to be racing around. All you want to do is lightly secure the shoe. Take your rated grouse when you're finished so that you can actually see what you've done mechanically. Note some particular characteristics of this job. Breakover is slightly behind the mark that I put on the foot originally. I have a parallel line between the base of P3 and the top of the shoe. I have arch support underneath. I've actually unloaded the front of the foot and loaded the back. It's very important for farriers and veterinarians to realize the value of taking the, the radiograph following this application because without seeing the before and after, it's very difficult to develop a sense of reality of what you're actually trying to accomplish. Let's review what we've actually accomplished. Note the lines. We are now have a parallel line between the base of the P3 in the top of the shoe. This is the finished job. Note the club foot looks a bit different than the other one. This is the mare moving immediately after being shod. She is still quite sore, but notice she's just slightly relieved when she makes her turn. This particular view shows this mare being shod with an egg bar with a bit of a raised heel. This is approximately five or six months later. I use very few egg bars for treating laminitis. Actually, this particular case have responded quite well to the shoeing that I've just shown for several weeks. And she leveled out and did not continue to improve at that point. At that stage, I performed bilateral deep flexor tenotomies on this particular mare. She continued then to improve at another steady uphill progressive mode. I used the egg bar on her to give her just a little more support uh, as she went home. As we can see in the next frame coming up, this mare is quite sound. This is approximately six months from the time we started on her. She's ready to travel home. Notice she has tons and tons of soul. That's my goal. That's the before, and this is an after trim. She's still got approximately one inch of good solid sole with good alignment. I have never touched the front face of her foot. This mare was actually barefoot through part of her therapy. If you notice, this is a four-point trim. This is my typical four-point trim. Notice breakover is straight beneath the apex of P3, I've got approximately one inch of sole over this area that I allow to load, callus, and toughen. The heel is pushed back to approximately the widest part of the frog. Note the angle that she has below P3, the bottom of P3 in relationship to the ground surface. Note that she has no rotation. She has normal alignment, and I have done nothing with a rasp to make this alignment. She has done that herself. That's the value of this entire technique.